Hi, uh, my name is Dave Wilkin. I'm a trombonist and music teacher based in Western North Carolina in the United States. Uh, just a little bit of a background about myself. I developed an interest in brass embouchure technique in the 1990s while a graduate student struggling to work through my own chop issues. <clears throat> and uh, in this video I'm going to describe two very basic but important brass embouchure characteristics that I think should help uh, everybody put the advice that we're giving and taking into more of a proper context. The first embouchure characteristic that I feel is important to address is the player's airstream direction. In spite of what some well-intentioned folks state, the air will not get blown straight down the shank of the mouthpiece, or at least it shouldn't since playing issues manifest when it does. Successful brass players will always blow the air either downstream so the air strikes the lower side of the mouthpiece cup, or upstream with the air being directed towards the upper part of the mouthpiece cup. Uh, this phenomenon isn't related to the musician's jaw position either. It is determined by the ratio of upper to lower lip inside the mouthpiece. Take a look at this video of a downstream trombonist from Lloyd Leno's film Lip Vibration of Trombone Embouchures. Notice that his mouthpiece placement is quite high and close to the nose. Look closely and you'll see that the airstream is being directed downward because of the predominance of the upper lip inside the cup. As downstream players play higher, the airstream gets directed even more sharply downward, and as they play lower, the airstream is directed closer to the shank of the mouthpiece. Compare that brass musician with this trombonist. This player does the opposite and places the mouthpiece so that it's much lower, closer to the chin. Due to the predominance of the lower lip inside the mouthpiece, the airstream for this embouchure type gets blown upward. Similarly, the higher this trombonist plays, the more upstream the air is blown. Players who place the mouthpiece close to half and half will usually have one lip predominate inside the cup, so the embouchure still functions either upstream or downstream. But often there are issues with a mouthpiece placement so close to half and half. I also want to point out that the horn angle and alignment of the teeth with the jaw position have a negligible effect on the player's airstream direction. You can find downstream players who place the mouthpiece closer to the nose that have horn angles that are close to straight out, or you can also find downstream players that have horn angles that are uh, uh, tilted down with a receded horn angle. Likewise, you can find upstream players who have a horn angle close to straight out, as well as upstream players who have a horn angle that is tilted down. Consider this tubist. When he plays in his low register, his lower lip predominates and he plays with an upstream embouchure. Around his middle C, his airstream flips direction and he switches to a downstream embouchure. He has two issues because of this embouchure type switching. First, his high range isn't as good as it can be and he needs to work very hard to play up there. Secondly, at the point of where he changes airstream directions, it's unstable and you can hear that he cracks the notes almost every time he plays there. When asked to play something that exposes this issue, you can hear in this clip how much of a problem this can be. This tubist either should move his placement higher on the lips or lower on the lips in order to eliminate this, this break. When working with him for a little while, his upper register struggles were a good clue as to what he should do. Since playing downstream wasn't working well for his upper register, I suspected that he should move his placement lower and play his entire range as an upstream player. Watch what happens when I ask him if there's anything he could do to get above the range he was struggling to play. After some careful experimentation, I was able to get him to play over his entire range with an upstream mouthpiece placement. It's initially difficult to have solid control for him, but his embouchure break disappears, his upper register is accessible for him, and he can play over his entire range with this setting. The other embouchure characteristic I want to bring to everyone's attention is a phenomenon that I prefer to call an embouchure motion. All brass players, whether or not they are aware of it, will push the mouthpiece rim and lips along the teeth in a generally upward and downward direction. This motion is natural and proper for brass playing, although it is not widely recognized and most players and teachers have no idea that it's there, but it is a very important part of a brass musician's embouchure technique. Compare these two trumpet players. 
The first pushes his mouthpiece and lips together upwards while ascending and pulls them down to descend. The other trumpet player does the reverse and pulls down to ascend while pushing up to descend. They are both downstream players, but the direction of their embouchure motion is opposite to each other. Here is a trumpet player I helped become aware of an issue with his embouchure motion. He had been having a lot of trouble with his upper register. If you watch him play these slurs, you will have trouble spotting a consistent embouchure motion. It almost looks like as if he's pulling down to descend in his lower register, but trying to get from G on top of the staff to the high C, he's not continuing to consistently push up to ascend, he's trying to pull back down again. This reversal of embouchure motion is sometimes found in the higher or lower register of players and can make the musician work harder or really struggle to play in that range. After some careful experimentation with this trumpet player, we were able to determine that his embouchure motion should be pushing the mouthpiece and lips up to ascend and pull down to descend. His correct embouchure motion is also not straight up and down, but should be angled so that he pushes up and to his right to ascend and pulls down into his left to descend. Because our teeth and gums are not a flat plane, but curved, the horn angle will need to adjust while playing in order to keep the foundation of the teeth and gums consistent under the mouthpiece rim and lips. Having him practice, also bringing his horn angle over to his right while ascending allows him to play higher than he was previously able to, and sounds more in tune and focused. half the strength to go up there. So in order to understand the way the horn angles come into play with the embouchure motion, it's important to understand that our, our teeth and gums are not a flat plane. Uh, there's some curvature to it, both on the as you go up and down and also um, probably a little bit more pronounced left and right. So as a player is making the embouchure motion and pushing and pulling their lips in an upward and downward direction, and most players at least have a little bit of side-to-side -side deviation, some players such as myself have a great deal of side-to-side -side deviation, in order to keep that, uh, uh, the, the consistent feel of the mouthpiece rim and lips contacting the teeth and gums underneath them, we need to change the horn angles around. So rather than thinking about doing this type of thing, with the mouthpiece where it's a flat plane, I think a ball and socket joint might be a good kind of uh, analogy to figure this out. So as the mouthpiece contacts the, the teeth and lips, if the player is pushing up, that horn angle is probably going to want to come up or down as the case may be. And if a player is, pu is pushing or pulling to the left and the right, you can see that the horn angle might want to go left or right as well in order to maintain that kind of foundation underneath the mouthpiece lips, uh, the foundation of the, the mouthpiece rim and lips uh, against the teeth and gums. So let me demonstrate that again with some octave slurs. So again, I'm pulling down into my left side, so I'm going to bring my horn angle down into the, my left side as well while I ascend. And when I descend, I'm going to bring my horn angle up slightly and towards my right side. This helps me keep the notes most in tune and just uh, makes it more efficient to play in those particular registers. <laughs> changes without, uh, I can make those uh, slurs rather without making those changes, but it's much harder and you'll hear the notes are not as well in tune. changes. 
So being able to uh, effectively move my horn angle around to where it needs to be is an important part of uh, my embouchure technique. And uh, even though players are going to have their own unique ways that they're going to bring their horn angles around and make the embouchure motion, um, I think it's necessary or, for all players to be able to have that freedom of horn angle shifting around in order to be able to find those spots and effectively go there. If you watch enough brass players closely enough, you'll be able to see that downstream players will either push the mouthpiece and lips up to ascend or pull down to descend. If they push up to ascend, their horn angle will more typically be close to straight out, while if they pull down to ascend, they will usually have a horn angle that is tilted down. Upstream players will almost always pull down to ascend, and usually have a horn angle that is close to straight out, but some players, such as myself, have a horn angle that is tilted down with a receded jaw position. Because these basic embouchure patterns function differently for each different player, certain exercises or instructions can have different results. What works great for one player can end up being destructive for another player, so it's worth learning about them so that you can evaluate whether your students or your own playing is being helped through practicing something specific. Even players belonging to the same embouchure type will have variations in how they play best. This is why I'm reluctant to advise anyone to adopt a particular embouchure characteristic without watching them play first, particularly if it's something based on a false premise, like aligning the teeth to blow straight down the shank of the mouthpiece. To be clear, the embouchure type that works best for the individual player isn't a choice to be made, and you can't practice your way into making one type work if your anatomical features don't make that your natural type. Deviating from the correct embouchure form for the musician's best type will cause problems, as will switching between the different embouchure types. It's possible to get better at playing in a manner that's ultimately wrong for your face, but you will do better in the long term by working with, rather than against, your anatomy. Lastly, the point of this video isn't to disparage what other players and teachers advise about brass embouchure technique, but rather to help us put their suggestions into a context that is based on how brass embouchures actually function while working efficiently for different players. Personally, I feel it's always best to approach pedagogy and practice from the standpoint of a more accurate understanding rather than a philosophical or pseudoscientific belief. If you want to learn more about what I've described in this video, I have a free resource on my blog called Embouchure 101 that takes you through these basic characteristics and goes into more detail about brass embouchure technique and the pedagogical implications of more accurate insight into functioning brass embouchures. Just go to www.wilktone.com and click on the link that says Embouchure 101.